Shorebirds are a diverse group of birds in several families that include sandpipers, plovers, avocets, oyster catchers, and phalaropes. There are about 217 species worldwide, of which 38 occur in Costa Rica. So what do shorebirds look like? Well, they have long legs for wading and walking in the mud, a long bill for probing sand and mud for food, mottled plumages help for camouflage. Most have an upright stance to get a better view. The pointed wings indicate long primary feathers for fast flight, and those long toes prevent them from sinking into the mud. Most shorebirds breed and raise their young in the far north and Arctic. Come fall, the weather turns cold and inhospitable, and soon there is little to eat. Other wildlife species have adapted to winter in other ways, but most birds just head south. Anyone from northern latitudes have seen ducks and geese heading to warmer climates, but actually hundreds of bird species like warblers and hummingbirds, migrate to avoid the winter. Shorebirds are included in this massive migration. Almost 70% of breeding North American species travel to their wintering grounds in Central and South America. Many of these come to Costa Rica, either on their way south or to pass the winter here. The trip is not easy, and some species have to fly over 8,000 kilometers just to get here. Studies have shown that some fly as high as 3,000 meters, and others travel at speeds of 80 kilometers per hour. But when they do get here, the weather is warm and there is food to be found. Shorebirds can be found in a variety of habitats, depending on the species and available options. The ocean's beaches have mollusks, insects, and worms buried in the sand. After flying for all those thousands of kilometers, it must feel good to get out and walk. Depending on the species, shorebirds like freshwater ponds, flooded fields, marshes of all kinds, river banks, both sandy and rocky, gravel bars, and a few species like the nicely kept short grass around airports. Costa Rica's Gulf of Nicoya presents a geographical situation that is perfect for shorebirds. Extensive mudflats are bordered by mangroves. Just inland of the mangroves, there are many commercial salt farms that contain shallow waters, and these become the resting place for shorebirds at high tide. Now because of the moon, the earth gets too low and too high tides. This flush of water is what provides the nutrients and makes mangroves a rich and important ecosystem, not only for shorebirds, but for fisheries and people. As the tide goes out, the birds get restless. They know that soon the water has receded to reveal a huge expanse of mudflats and their feeding grounds. The mudflats are just across the mangroves, a mere 500 meters away. The movement of the tides determine where the birds will be. There's the mud! Not only do shorebirds flock to the mud flats, but many species of egrets and herons do too.
Now what do all these birds eat? Well, the same things we do, mostly. They come from the coast. But since we are so big, we want the larger portions, like this well-known crustacean. Or the combo plate. Tasty. Now these birds do eat many kinds of insects, which we won't be eating until we run out of other foods. Their diet includes larvae, isopods, and flies. In Asia, people do eat giant water bugs, just like shorebirds do, but without frying and the spices. Since shorebirds are small, much of their food is tangy. Marine worms and other strange to us species are major foods. Many shorebirds eat mollusks of all sorts. And just like we have to do, they have to pry them open to get to the meat. The American oyster catcher has a built-in shucker. Shorebirds wash up after the meal. Recent research has demonstrated the importance of intertidal biofilm as a major part of the diet of small sandpipers. Minute hairs on the bird's tongue are covered in mucus and lift off globs of biofilm. High densities of snails grazing on biofilms can have a negative competitive effect on small sandpipers. 70% of shorebirds feed in water that is less than 4 inches deep. So shorebirds are restricted by these aquatic habitats. When you find shorebirds at migration time, you always find many different species together. This is a group for beginner bird watchers. It does get a lot more difficult. Patience always pays off. Black-bellied plovers are the security force for shorebirds. They are the first to sound an alarm if danger approaches. This innate alertness allowed the population to survive the period of market hunting in the past centuries. One big problem with identification of shorebirds is that they look different in breeding and non-breeding plumages. You just have to learn both of them. These plovers will roost together in mangroves, which is a useful tropical adaptation. Oddly, they are the only plover that has a hind toe, but it is so tiny you can hardly see it. They like to run down beaches and tidal flats chasing down food. Semi-palmated plovers breed in remote parts of the Arctic. Up there, it is known to nest around buildings and runways. They can actually swim short distances while feeding. Their foraging behavior is called run, stop, and peck. And their favorite foods include mollusks, crustaceans, and marine worms. Yummy! One of their tricks is to hold one foot ahead of the other, raised at an angle. Then they wiggle their toes as they touch the ground. This causes their prey to run and scatter, revealing their position. Threat displays and intraspecific aggression are common during migrations. Wilson's plovers stay close to the coastline. They aren't very numerous, and they hang out high on the beach, like around dunes. They do forage on salt flats and mud flats, where they dash out after crabs. Wilson's plover 
in the foreground is distinguished from semi-palmated plovers by their pink legs and bigger bills. They are considered a specialist hunter of fiddler crabs. It's surprising on how many crabs just appear at low tide. They won't be found on beaches modified by people. Plovers in general have larger eyes than many shorebirds, and that helps them catch small creatures. The collared plover is a wary, uncommon resident. They live on mudflats, gravel bars, and on sandy beaches littered with flotsam, and in this case, lots of plastic. Here at the mouth of the Tarkalus River is one of the best places to see collared plovers. These plovers like the high tide line, where all the flotsam is, both on the beach and over here on the mud flats. They have the strategy of run, stop, and peck, and particularly likes beach fleas. Oh, that's good. Snowy plovers nest on sand in open areas. They forage as individuals or in pairs looking for invertebrates on ocean beaches, tidal flats, salt flats, and gravel bars. Interestingly, young plovers leave their nest within three hours of hatching and begin foraging immediately. No help from mom is needed. Now the Kildare is a shorebird that doesn't like the shore and spends its time inland where it can be found on runways and lawns where it's looking for insects, worms, tadpoles, isopods, and that kind of thing. The southern lapwing, which is the largest of the plover family, first showed up in Costa Rica in 1997 moving in from South America. Now they are established in the lowlands of both the Atlantic and the Pacific slopes. They like open grassy areas near water and they are aggressive birds and will dive bomb you, so stay away from their nests. American oyster catchers are in their own family and they are specialist feeders on mollusks, as the name indicates. They are very tenacious at going after oysters and can be seen feeding in belly deep water. American oyster catchers are resident on small islands in Costa Rica. And the North American population migrates to northern South America. They are found both on sandy beaches and rocky shores. Just see how they blend in to the black rocks and white sands here. The trick is not to move. The Shorebird Award for Elegance goes to the Black Necked Stilt. These birds are residents in the Gulf of Nicoya, but are passage migrants elsewhere in Costa Rica. Stilts use their stilts to forage in deep water, plucking tiny insects from the surface. They also probe sand and mud for food. Only flamingos have proportionally longer legs. On their breeding grounds, if a predator approaches, a whole group of stilts come around, jumping, hopping, and flapping their wings to drive it away. American Ovisets keep their eggs cool by maintaining their belly feathers wet. Their call gradually rises in pitch, simulating the Doppler effect and making their approach seem faster than it really is. Sometimes a female Ovisette will lay eggs in the nest of another female, who incubates them without noticing. 
During the breeding season, godwits probe deep, looking for worms, crustaceans, and small clams. But during migration, they feed almost exclusively on plant tubers. Their bill is adapted for clipping tubers. Most marbled godwits breed in the Great Plains, but there are two far-flung populations, one in James Bay, Canada, and the other on the Alaskan Peninsula. Godwits like to hang out with wimbrels. Wimbrels walk with their body horizontally as they go snatching, probing, and poking for crabs. They may forage alone, but wimbrels sleep with other birds in dense groups. They are a common migrant and a winter resident. Soft-shelled crabs are best eaten whole. These are what wimbrels dream about. Ghost shrimp and coffee bean snails. The long-billed curlew, the largest shorebird, is a rare migrant to the Gulf of Nicoya in Costa Rica. Curlews have these exceptionally long curved bills to find aquatic invertebrates deep in the mud. Male and female both look alike, and they both incubate the eggs and take care of the young, kind of, because the female takes off two to three weeks after hatching. The male finishes the work, and either he forgives her or forgets, as they often pair up the following year. No other shorebird can probe as deep with its impossibly long bill. While perfectly adapted for catching buried aquatic invertebrates, it is also used to catch grasshoppers on its breeding grounds in the grasslands of the Great Plains and the Great Basin. The upland sandpiper is another rebellious one, like the Kildare, in that it doesn't really like the sand and the surf, and prefers pasture, airstrips, and open areas more inland. Upland sandpipers are an indicator species of North American prairie. Willets are easily seen on mud flats and salinas. They feed on crabs, insects, and small fishes. Their piercing call is very distinctive. Because they find food using their sensitive tips of their bills and not just their eyes, they can feed both during the day and the night. Willets form large groups to sleep and loaf around and don't mind the company of other shorebirds. John James Audubon, the famous American naturalist, loved to make willet egg omelets and thought the young were fat and juicy by fledgling time. Go figure. Willets and wimbrels are good buddies. This sandpiper is usually seen, well, alone, to start with, and along freshwater ponds, rivers, and marshes but avoids mud flats.
Solitary sandpipers like shallow water. They may have the headphones on because they bob their heads frequently and move their bodies and pump their tails. The solitary sandpiper lays its eggs in old nests of songbirds in trees. That's probably why its nest wasn't discovered until 1913. The greater yellow eggs has been called a dashing solitary figure on the mudflats and marshes. Notice the length of the bills difference of the two yellow leg species. Greater yellow legs breed in northern boreal bogs where the mosquito density is at its maximum. This wary sandpiper perches atop small trees to watch for nest predators and has a loud alarm call. By standing on one leg, a bird reduces by half the amount of heat lost through unfeathered limbs. They chase small fishes, tadpoles, aquatic insects, and crustaceans. They definitely have a more aggressive hunting strategy. They wade deep into the water to forage for insects and small crustaceans. The lesser yellow legs is more related to the willet than to the greater yellow legs. One always has to be careful at the water's edge. The ruddy turnstone actually does flip rocks. It's looking for insects and other creatures to feed on. Ruddy turnstones have special feet that are spiny with curved toenails that help them hang on to slippery rocks. The two species of turnstones fly fast, over 60 kilometers an hour, to fly the extreme distances between breeding and non-breeding grounds. Turnstones eat insects, mollusks, fish eggs, and vegetable material. Like spotted sandpipers, they hold feeding territories in the day, but sleep in groups. The wandering tattler likes rocky habitats where it finds mollusks and crustaceans, like these shrimps and has one of the better bird names in English. It's wandering because it's found on islands all across the vast Pacific, and a tattler because its alarm calls alert other birds. The spotted sandpiper is a common migrant found in all aquatic habitats. Their signature move is the hindquarter pump, it forages by running at the water's edge, stopping abruptly, and snatching. Snatching items include insects, crabs, small fishes, etc. Although it defends a feeding territory, at the end of the day, spotted sandpipers get together and sleep in large flocks. So it's kumbaya all night. Then it's back to aggressively defending territories in the morning. <laughs>